let me bring in Dr. Justice Sherem Sai on this. In fact, you, you've said a number of things, and, and so separating them is, is going to be quite a task, but I'll do the best I can. From the position of the law and that argument that the speaker, in, in the view of uh, Dr. Jato, should have said something about the Supreme Court I mean, this is not a ruling. It was, it was a, 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 a directive, so to speak, to him to stay the execution of the, the, the decision that he had communicated, declaring those forces vacant. Was that a lawful request to make? Thank you very much. Um, before I answer this question, I think there's something we need to uh, be mindful of. Mm -hmm. I believe that sometimes we over-legalize simple matters. And this conversation around this particular issue is one of such situations where we have over-legalized the issue. And when you over-legalize issues, what happens is that you miss out on the fundamental issue or the fundamental purpose of what we are even discussing. What is before us? It is a simple question of, do we want people who are on a ticket of a political party to while still on the ticket of that political party, be contesting against the interests of that party. You see, when you strip this issue of all the legalities and all the arguments and all the forum, this is a simple matter of whether as a people, mm -hmm. as a country, as a nation, we are interested or we want people who, are, who have gone out to campaign on the ticket of a political party or a political vehicle based on ideology, after assuming the seats, to then decide that while they are still sitting on that seat representing a particular political interest, could then shift and be contesting against the interests of that political party. And I think when we look at the issue from this perspective, it becomes very clear that the legalities don't matter. Now, the reason why we should... Oh, uh, gentlemen, yes. No, that's what I'm saying, yes. So now we, 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 we have to look at certain principles that we have adopted as a people for ourselves. We opted for multi-party democracy. What does that mean? What it means is that we as a people have decided that we don't want all of us to follow one thing. Mm -hmm. We want people to have choices between political ideas, between political solutions, and between national matters. That is why we have multi-party democracy. This is guaranteed in the Constitution to the extent that even if that even if someone tries to form a one-party state, the constitution says that parliament doesn't even have the power to make such a law. Right. But that is how much we value multi-party democracy. Mm -hmm. Then again, when you go back to the constitution, the constitution tells us about conflict of interest, which simply means that we should not put ourselves as public officials in a position where our interests or we will be conflicting two different interests. And then apart from that, the constitution further goes on to say that a person can only belong to one political vehicle or political party at a time. These are all express provisions in the Constitution. So to my mind, when you tell me that we should allow, when you ask me the question whether we should allow someone to be on a ticket of one political party, mm -hmm. okay, and at the same time be contesting the interests of that political party with another vehicle, it, doesn't, it is not a difficult question for me to answer. It is that I don't think taking all this into consideration, this is not what... I think the that, premise that's of the article constitution. 97 one. Yeah, that, that is, this is not what so the Now, let me go back to your question. So, that you asked. Uh, Cynthia Morrison cannot stay in this eighth parliament as an NPP member, as she has so declared that she's going to contest Agona West as an independent candidate. I, I subscribe to the view that you cannot be a member of one political party. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, be contesting the interests of that political party. Because there's a candidate for the MPP. Exactly. In and in fact, the various political parties acknowledge the point, they acknowledge the point I'm making. Mm -hmm. That is why if you go through their constitutions, they have stated it clearly that you forfeit. And when we say there's a, there's no, there's a difference between saying you'll be expelled and you forfeit. When we say you forfeit, it means that you have left, you have abandoned them. So it's not in anyone's action. We don't need further ceremony for you to leave. It means okay. that you... So, even the political parties themselves subscribe to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. The constitution prescribes what I'm saying. 
So if you strip this issue of all the legalities and all the Supreme Court and all the, this is the simple issue before us. Now beyond that, let's come to the speaker. Uh, let me address the issue about whether the speaker, what the speaker could have done on, was it Tuesday or Wednesday? Which so was the question you asked me. Yes, but even before that, so you subscribe to the position that Article 97 does not create any ambiguity or confusion in the mind I, of, I, of anybody if you're even seeking to understand it. It doesn't create any ambiguity. And if, if, it, if it does, the resolution of that ambiguity should be in favor of what the political parties themselves are putting in their constitutions, what mm -hmm. the constitution has said in about three different provisions. Right. And you need to read the constitution as a whole. You cannot just pick one provision and then separate and and all and say that you have, inter you have interpreted the constitution. So that is the first point. The second point is, what would the speaker have done? Let, let's, let's examine the ruling of the court. That is the only way we will know what the speaker would have done. The court made two orders. It says what? Like you put it, the execution of the declaration should be stayed. Okay? And when you use the word stay, you are assuming that there is an ongoing process which must be stayed. Mm -hmm. But if there is an event which has already happened, you would not be doing justice to that situation when you say it should be stayed. Because then stay means that after the event, whatever is the situation is, must stay as it is. Okay. That is the first order. Then the Supreme Court went on to make a second order, which says that the four MPs should be allowed into the house to what? To, to participate in the... In the, in the, in the and, that's and the second do their order. work. And as, do their work MPs. fully. And that's the second one. Now, the second one, so when you read the two together, it appears the Supreme Court is saying that we should reverse <laughs> the situation. We should reverse the situation where the four... MPs, because at the time of the order, mm -hmm. the four MPs were effectively, you know, after they've been they, they yes. vacated, they've been declared, the seat have been declared vacant. Mm -hmm. So if you want to reverse it, that will require a parliamentary decision. Because right. the court, when the court directs a company, let's say TV3, mm -hmm. that you should reinstate an employee that you have sacked, the court cannot itself come and reinstate the, 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 the employee. It will take the management of TV3 to carry out that reversal of what reinstating the employee. Now, the point I'm making is that, as at the time the speaker was on the floor, the house was not properly constituted for parliamentary business, mm -hmm. which means that even if the speaker wanted a decision to implement the, 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 the ruling or the direction of the Supreme Court, which is the reversal, it couldn't have happened because the speaker himself is not, the speaker doesn't take decision in parliament unless there's a word, a tie. Mm -hmm. The only way the speaker comes is when there is a tie. But beyond that, it is the members of parliament who have even the power to legislate. Uh -huh. Even so, when there is a tie. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah even he cannot. So he cannot. So you see, uh, what I mean is that when he's split, when he's uh, split in the tie. It means it's falling. It's falling. So, great. Falling. So you see, so the speaker himself cannot be the one to take that decision mm -hmm. or do carry out the orders of the court. It is the parliament properly constituted. Now the question is, at the time the speaker was speaking, which, and I'm, I'm referring to my uh, very good friend here, who was saying that the speaker has disobeyed or has ignored. The speaker couldn't have done anything. And the House couldn't have done taking a decision because at the time, the House was not properly constituted in terms of quorum for a decision making. Uh, just, just a quick, I never said the speaker disobeyed the ruling. Okay, you, you were, but you were trying to, you were trying no, to say... I didn't know, he, he didn't make a decision. I said he didn't make a decision. Yeah, yeah, so, so then you were ruling. expecting him to do that. So yes, yes. Yeah. And I, and I, I, I never said... He disobeyed the court. Thank, thank well, you, thank you. Well, but that, we I mean, shouldn't drag it. it but it, I think it, the right. point he was trying to make was that the speaker w did something wrong, mm -hmm. and you were trying to even correct him that that no, was. I wrong. was simply saying that oh. the speaker. I expected. I thought the speaker should. Okay, the point I'm making well, is that the speaker mm -hmm. could not have done anything, okay. Okay. and Parliament yeah. could not have done anything okay. because the House was not constituted for decision making. Mm -hmm. So we should not uh, belabor that point. Mm -hmm. Now, when we come into the issue of separation of powers and i think it's something that we need to all uh, be interested in you see when the americans americans were the ones who uh, molded this kind of democracy mm -hmm. which we are trying to emulate because when they gained independence from britain they decided that they are not going to run the british system of government they are going to create three separate arms of government and that no one person can belong to more than one and that the three arms are going to be equal Okay. So that is the paramount thing, that the three arms are equal. On, you cannot run an effective government system if one of the arms of government becomes the headmaster for the rest. You can't run an effective, then you are, you are back to a dictatorship.
Okay. So now let's see what we can do to improve our checks and balances and separation of power system. Mm -hmm. It appears, and I think it has been consistent within the past few years, that when a parliamentary proceeding is ongoing, some way, somehow, the matter gets before the court, and the court makes orders to suggest that what is actually going on should stay pending the determination of the court. Mm -hmm. If we uphold, I'm going to create two scenarios. Then we'll choose the one that will probably uphold separation of powers better. Right. If we carry on this way, and that any time there is an ongoing, you know, deliberation in parliament, and then someone goes to court, it could be a member of parliament, it could be an ordinary citizen goes to court, and the court will say, stay pending the determination of the matter. Mm -hmm. Eventually, what we are trying to say is that the courts can now stop parliament from doing whatever it wants to do at any time because someone has filed a suit. And even before the determination of the merit of the suit, it should be everything that parliament is doing must be put on hold. And that must concern everyone. Mm -hmm. Everyone must be worried if that is the impression or that is the, the, the precedent we are trying to set or that the that situation of constitution. Everybody must be worried. That's because, essentially what that's what's doing. happening. Mm -hmm. the, you know, because my understanding of judicial review is that when parliament has done something, eventually the court have the final say as to whether the thing is constitutional or not. That question is settled. Mm -hmm. But the, the, what we are seeing is not the same as what judicial review is. It's as if even while trying to do the thing, the court can stop parliament in its track. And, and then the, until the decision is finally made. I can understand situations where it will be necessary that things like that will happen. But when it becomes a habit, and even to the extent that even as soon as the person files the motion, whether the court has even looked at it or not, the argument is that there is a pending case, so I won't do anything until the court decides. And the courts often not, don't decide these issues you know, uh, quickly. Okay. And I think we should all be concerned and be worried. I believe that parliament is a political you know, place, okay? And the courts are a court of law. When it comes to constitution and constitutional law, I think it is agreed among constitutional scholars and jurisprudence that mm -hmm. a constitution is both a legal document mm -hmm. and a political document. It is not entirely a legal document where every matter can be resolved by courts. And you see, the, the founder of British constitutional law, A.V. Dice, has made this point clear that there is a conventional element of a constitution and a legal element of the constitution. And the courts have power to deal with only the legal element. And when it comes to the conventional element, which I call the American call the political element, which is the political question, okay. that is for politicians mm -hmm. and voters to decide. Mm -hmm. It is not every problem that the courts can solve. And the courts will be probably assuming too much if they believe that every political, every issue must be litigated and resolved. Then they will be. That there will be a, it will be contrary to any principle of constitutional law. It will be contrary to any principle of, of, of law mm -hmm. for that matter. So is, I believe is it that one of such cases with what we are dealing right now with right now that that the, in your view, the the Supreme Court really shouldn't be meddling in in, in in a political matter like this. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that they are meddling or they are not meddling. My point is that the court should build a jurisprudence which entrenches. The principle of separation of powers and the equality of the arms of government. Okay. Gradually, what we be what we are beginning to see is not reflecting that principle. Okay. So my point is that sometimes we should we should both even the members of parliament mm -hmm. we should agree that in the house it is politics, and the more you drag in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court will look more political because. Parliament is a political forum mm. where there are so many tools of resolving parliamentary issues. Right. There are so many tools of resolving political issues. There are few tools for resolving legal issues. Mm -hmm. So I would believe that such a matter should have been more of resolved within the House. And even if it went to the court, I was thinking that the court would take a decision which would uphold the separation of powers and the, and the equality of the arms of government. So this and but, but this this particular directive does not do that. But what we assume with this Supreme Court directive to to Parliament or in, fa in fact to the Speaker. I I believe that it does not really you know it does not it does not 
ensure the equality of the arms of government. Okay. Because it seeks to stop parliament in its track in making a decision. And it seeks to go into the house to direct certain things, even before the merits of the matter is, 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 is looked at. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem if at the end of the day, the court analyzes, and says, uh, uh, analyzes the entire case on its merit and says that look, what you did was wrong. And therefore, we should, we should, you know, uh, 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 we should reverse it mm -hmm. based on the merit. But even before deciding the merits, the court says, don't do such a thing. Based on an ex parte uh, uh, application. Well, that is even another side of the ex parte when all the facts have not really been, been tested. And, and we are beginning to see that even the hand slide or the copy of the proceedings that was presented to the court was not the official copy. And, and also, some of the arguments that were made were not really what it was. So, for example, the court found that the persons who, the, the four MPs mm -hmm. and their constituents are being disenfranchised by, by, by the people's you know, removal from the house. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, if there's any disenfranchisement, it is not the action in parliament because the constitution itself says that you cannot have a by-election within a certain period, which means that the framers of the constitution... Six months before. Yes, uh, yeah. So it means that the framers of the constitution themselves do not intend such people to be represented. When your people, you know, change uh, uh, cross carpet, you cannot have a by-election. So it is not even the parliament that is making that decision is the the, the, what, the the constitution itself which says that you cannot have a, a, a vote you know so when we look at some of these things it appears that a more uh, a, 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 a more critical position would be that first of all i don't think this issue should have gone to the court in the first place and even if you went there uh, i would be happy if the court after looking at the merits of the case decides that this is what the situation is that is judicial review 